Well, I'd just like to welcome you all to this session. Um, we're going to be joining Lindy Fors, who's been working in the area of adult instruction and curriculum development for the past seven years at Northern Lakes College in Northern Alberta, Canada. Um, we're going to have a discussion about online learning for adult students at the basic education level. Um, Lindy has a BA from Simon Fraser University and she's currently participating in the Master of Education program at the University of Calgary under the Adult and Community Learning Specialisation in Educational Research. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from her and um, so um, I'd like to welcome you all here and I'd like to also thank all the sponsors we have and um, particularly thank you to Steve Hargadon um, for Blackboard collabor Collaborate um, and all the people at the Australia E-Series who set up this and have been um, preparing it so well for us. Um, thank you to all of them. Um, and maybe you'd like to tell us where you all are from by picking up one of the little smiley faces or the um, the little worlds and putting them on your place and maybe you could um, tell us also in the text where you are and um, anything else that you would like to tell us, what the weather's like or uh, what time of day it is for you. Um, and we're looking forward to having a great session um, with Lindy and I'll hand it over to her now. Thank you, Joe, Joffrey. I appreciate it. And welcome, everyone, to my session, The Changing Face of ABE. My name is Lindy Fors, and it's my honor to be presenting to you today at Aussie Live. So a shout out to all you Aussies from a Canuck. I'm just going to put my video on for a moment and say hello. Here's my hand. And then I'll turn it off. So this afternoon, or this evening for me, morning for you, we're going to look at online basic education programming at the college I work at, Northern Lakes College, and explore some of the barriers and best practices that we encounter. And I'll share some preliminary research that I've done, and then we'll end with some takeaway ideas that hopefully you can use in your online environments. Hopefully you're in the right session, so let's begin. So I'm really looking forward to spending this time with you, and I hope that it'll be engaging and informative. The first thing we'll be doing is looking at some ways you can participate as we move along. Then I'll ask you to locate yourself, not only in the physical sense, but where you are in regards to adult basic education, teaching, and online learning. We'll look a little bit at the ABE programming and the changes that we've gone through here at our college, a little bit at some research that I've started yeah, just finished phase one in September, in January, that started in September. And then we'll look at some of the barriers and best practices as it applies to basic education students online. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this technology, I just wanted to sh show you a couple of ways you can participate. So you feel free to use your emoticons. It's nice to see a smiley face or a thumbs up if you agree with something that's being said or you can connect to it. One thing to note is if you see those orange lights, like I can see a couple of you are, and probably some a little bit like a chipmunk, so I'll try and talk a little bit lower. Of course, make any comments or questions in the chat. And feel free to answer questions with the yes, no, using your check mark. And I do have a couple of quick little polls that I'll be taking a little later on, so you would click on the same button to answer. You can always use the chat, too, if you're not comfortable with the technology. So what I want to begin with is, why are you in the session? What are you hoping to take away? 
You can write it in the chat or you can click on the talk button and share it with us now. I see Mel's typing in the chat. Sarah, welcome. And Coach Carol, if you're able to type in the chat, that's wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful to hear a primary degree. That's I was trained I got excited. I was trained in K to twelve and it was a really interesting transition to go to adult education. And we all are adults and we all are adult learners, so we can relate to it in many ways, I think. So at any time, oh, Sarah, you're moving to Taiwan and consider teaching adults. That's excellent. I did teach ESL um, for a short time when I was getting my BN in Vancouver. There I am. And it was really, really interesting. I, like I said, I was trained in K-12, to and I actually worked at a Head Start program and a K-4 to instructor as well as grade 6 and 7 in high school. I've taught on First Nation reserves um, and here in town in Slave Lake, Alberta. I'm teaching adults. As you can see, I have my own little elder that teaches me a lot. He's probably my greatest teacher. And so is the land that surrounds me. So we were just talking a little earlier about the beauty of Canada. This kind of landscape's only about five minutes away from me. This moose actually was on the road just a couple minutes up. And I thought it was a nice picture because he is sticking out his tongue, and that's my favorite thing to do in pictures. And of course, the road. For those of you who haven't lived in a small town or a rural environment, the road is very, very important. It's there because transportation and accessibility to services are really big issues and for all of us, but especially for our students. So as you can see, our college supports a pretty vast region. It's almost the size of Florida, 163,000 kilometers squared. We have 18 campuses. We are on what's known as Treaty 8 land, so our indigenous First Nations people. This is a shot of the cultural camp that they do at Garrard, which is one of our campuses, and they do that every summer. So just to give you a snapshot, this is our region, and it shows you where all our different campuses are located. So that's why our road is so important. Um, here, obviously, it's minus 26 right now, so there's a lot of snow. We have to drive in pretty terrible weather sometimes just to get services. Now, I'm not sure how much you, you know about the uh, Indigenous people in Canada, but we have Métis, which are um, a, a cross of a First, First Nations in white. We have First Nations, pure First Nations, and in this area it's Cree primarily, Dene, and there is some beaver and Slavey, and that explains the name Slave Lake. It's after the Slavey people. And of course we have our towns and villages scattered throughout, and this picture down here is a pretty common sight at most of our campuses. The one over on the right is Slave Lake. If we're lucky we have a pool. We have a lot of services that a lot of our other places in our region don't have. And this all does connect to our academic upgrading program. We're here to provide stewardship and access to education. That's our mandate. And so we provide upgrading support to a diverse demographic of students, including rural, remote, First Nations, and Métis. We even have a campus up north in a town that's primarily Mennonite. So most of our students are Mennonite ladies. Our program has both pre-high school and basic education and our high school courses. So it's really important to situate ourselves, locate ourselves with the terms, especially when we're talking about different nations. So I'm just going to change this to polling, 
And if you would care to, either in the chat or right underneath your name, you'll see the letter A. Click on a letter that matches the answer to how do you name basic education. So it can fall under different umbrellas, literacy, basic education, foundational learning, or there might be another term that you're used to hearing or using. It looks like my poll isn't working. It shows up on mine, so I apologize. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. Oh, foundational learning. OK. Sorry, Lindy. Um, people on uh, tablets or mobile devices don't have the option, so that's why they're putting those into chat. Oh, OK. Thank you. I'm not was it familiar with that. So with the other, that we have one more poll, and then that's it. But um, it's really interesting to learn that foundational learning is something that you're using as well. Oh, thank you. And it's quite big in our province as well. Unfortunately, with a lot, we've been going through a lot of budget cuts. Alberta is very well known for oil. And as you know, the oil prices have been taking a dive. So a lot of our foundational learning programs are actually getting cut in the province, which is really a shame. And we, we may have already thought about this, but how are you connected to the topic? So we located ourselves as what you, uh, I know we have a teacher, right? We have, uh, we all are connected to adult learning in some way. But if you'd care to take the poll and kind of place yourself within the profession, it's a good way to see where everybody's situated. Yay, I'm speaking to the choir. So I have teachers and then others. So Joffrey, if you'd like to type in the chat what your connection is to basic education, that'd be great. So while we have a couple of our participants typing, there's the poll. Oh, didn't turn out. It's better when there's more participants, obviously. But I'll just place us in the definitions as it relates to what I'll be speaking about. So obviously, ABE is adult basic education. Online, when I talk about adult basic education online at the college, it's synchronous online classes. So that's live classes. Online, though, online ABE, we have a, um, three levels, a Bell 1, 2, 3 level. And our online ABE is only at the Bell 3 level, or basic education level programming. And that's about a grade 8 and 9 equivalency. In total, we have 13 courses in all content areas. But when we get to the lower levels, they are actually taught on site. Oh, that sounds really interesting, Joffrey, an information service gift and resources for teachers. I hope that I have to use those services as my son gets bigger. Now, when we look at AB at, at NLC, just to give you a, a bit of a context, our first distance instructor was in 1990, and he was a high school instructor. And I'm told that he hitchhiked campuses with worms in a backpack for science labs. Uh, distance was done by phone and modules, and it was high school only. From what I understand, our on-site instructors, they would get a hand-drawn map and some resources, and they'd be told, good luck, we'll see you in December. And off they would travel. So obviously, there's been a big shift over the years with online connectivity. And we used to have very large ABE classes, and now we have much lower cohorts. There's a lot better access to the K-12 education system in the area. There's also a changed perception of education and the need for education now and certification to get a job and, and make a higher standard of living for families is very well known and recognized. There is also increasing ESL in the area. And there's an ongoing need for EAL. So for those of you who don't know, that's English as another language. So many of our students grew up in households that maybe spoke Cree 
and English, and maybe not either one that well. Definitely didn't read or write in either of them probably that well. So they're coming to us with a variety of challenges. And then we have uh, changes to funding. So a lot of our students rely on the government funding to come to school. We have predominantly single parents, a uh, high, high percentage of single moms. We have students usually in the range of 25 to 40. And they, uh, they really rely on that funding model in order to upgrade their skills. And for basic education, uh, Val Neves was the basic education coordinator. She didn't start till 2003. Before that, it was very ad hoc. I was told that students would be given a book and then told when you complete that, you go to the next level. So it was very, that, very much that volunteer literacy base. She took, did a survey of the students. And what she found out was those pre-high school students, they wanted to be integrated into the learning community. They wanted the same options available to them as the high school students. So that meant online, and it meant participating in some of the learning activities that we used to do. What we did a couple of years ago was we tried to look at the vision of our basic education program. So we had a contest, and this is what one of our instructors came up with, and it was achieving goals, becoming confident, and enriching lives. And lately with the transitions, well, it's become very much focused on employability. Thank you. As well as uh, employability, funding issues, and online, of course. And that's why I'm here today. So right now, all of our Bell 301 courses are offered online. We've only done that in the last four years. The students are online in their classes anywhere from two days a week to five days a week. So for our English language arts class, it's every day for 80 minutes. For our Bell Social Studies, it's one, uh, sorry, two blocks a week. And then they have study blocks that they do on site. As well, our basic education students are expected to achieve core competencies. So that's those true grade levels eight and nine, in this case, in one semester, which is five months. So we're asking an awful lot. So that, and being in a master's program, led me to starting a research project last September. So what's really predominant here in Alberta is the phrase, anytime, anywhere, courses and resources. And it's a really big phrase that's promoted and it's to bring attention to accessibility. Um, it's what students say that they want at any time, anywhere. But what I found was there was no reference to instructors or pedagogy. So it caused me to think, what does it mean to our programming and our basic education students, especially those underrepresented learners, the ones who arrive with low computer literacy and even lower self-efficacy? Was online re learning really the panacea for these learners? And would it really make everything better? So what it led to is an examination of our programming. And we've been offering distance education at the high school level since the 90s. So it was correspondence, telephone, video conference. And then online, we've been doing it. We started with Centra, and now it's Illuminate and Blackboard Collaborate. So our Bell Education courses actually have only been online for the last four years. Before that, they were always taught on site. And we offer these levels, the math, the science, the social studies. This math is like a pre-university studies level math. And the 301 math leads them to more of a trades math. The communications is our English language arts level. So I started looking at some of our statistics. So the star here tells me what year this course went online. And except for the 301 math, which is a bit of an anomaly, it looks like, upon first glance, that our completion rates, our pass-fail rates, went down ever since the courses went online. Now, I don't want to jump to conclusions. I'm th I was thinking, could there be a general correlation between courses moving online and students being less successful? 
And the other question is, is it just about being online or is there some way we can adjust our programming to meet those needs and the wants of our students to have that accessibility and the online flexibility? I was inspired. So I wanted to know, are we meeting students where they're at? You know, that basic pedagogy that really applies. I wanted to know, is there research supporting wise practices for online ABE students? And I just wanted to point out the reason why I sometimes refer to it instead of best practices, wise practices, is in the Indigenous tradition, there's a leadership, an Aboriginal leadership um, program down in Banff, and a lot of really excellent research has come out of there. And the reason why wise practices is sometimes adopted is that one size doesn't fit all. So when we talk about best practices, there's an assumption that there is a, one way to do it. There's a best practice. A wise practice means that we do cater to the diverse needs of our learners. So that means we need to look at what kind of program planning should we be taking into consideration. And I wanted to see what are the implications for our programming for our pedagogy. So really, it boils down to how is face-to-face -face translating online. It's only been happening for five, four years. And how are we doing? And I also wanted to look at the role of our on-site facilitator and the efficacy of online instructor and ABE students. So on all of our campuses, we have 18, we have a learning facilitator and they teach our on-site courses as well as facilitate programming. So they support students, they tutor them, they help them with technology. Think of a one-room schoolhouse and they pretty much do it all. And I wanted to see a way that we could capture this. So I was inspired by Photo Voice, which is research that tells a story. But the magnitude of it didn't quite work for my project. There was, wasn't going to be media involvement or exhibits because of the logistics and the region we cover. It was too difficult. We don't have a set of digital cameras for people to use. So it ended up becoming photo stories because it wasn't really about the photos. It was about the stories that were coming out of taking the photos and reflecting on it. And it was supposed to, and it's been having the effect of not only having reflection and conversation happening, but defining and making visible the barriers and best practices that anybody who works with students at this level know they're facing. So to capture this in a research project, and especially in pictures, it has a lot of power. So my hope is that it will inform instructional programming, our professional development of our faculty, and learning environments that support online ABE students and it hopefully it impact our learner retention and success as well. So like I said, I just finished phase one. I had five participants. I had one full-time online instructor. I had one fully on-site learning facilitator who did no online instruction at all. I also had one new learning facilitator and one learning facilitator who taught one online class as well. And I also placed myself within the research because I believe in that paradigm. Phase two's just been approved, and I'm really excited about it because I think it's just going to make this research so robust. We're getting students, instructors, learning facilitators, counselors, administrators, support staff. So we'll get a really wide scope of what people are seeing. Just as an aside, what made me um, inspired by this is I worked on some research for student wellness, and I was having conversations with other people in other departments and our facilities director said, you know, we actually see student issues long before the instructor, especially if they're staying at a dorm. And it made me realize, you know, it's very important to get everybody involved in the conversation. So some of the preliminary findings are themes community, interpersonal relationships, and the learning environment is a very big theme. This instructor was noticing that community closeness, especially on a First Nations reserve, it can be a really big support for students. It can also create huge issues and barriers because if there's conflict within the community, everybody's involved. The same thing happens with tragedy. If there's a tragedy in the community, 
pretty much everybody in that community is impacted. You're looking at communities about the size of anywhere from 300 to 1,000 people. And most of them are related to each other in some way. So that's something that we cope with at, from an instructional and programming point of view is how do we compensate for these very real issues that our learners are going through in order to ensure that they do achieve success and get through their program. Another very big theme, obviously, would be the face-to-face -face online teaching. So this instructor is seeing how different it is going from the on-site environment to a face-to-face -face environment. So what happens and what we're seeing is often very good face-to-face -face teachers are placed in an online environment with little to no know how, in, how to apply the online strategies. They might have very good face-to-face -face strategies, but they're at a bit of a loss in how to apply them online. What ends up happening is more of that lecture style, which is good in some situations, but for an entire semester is not really going to engage the learners. Another theme is, of course, accessibility and flexibility to the, for the students. So something that an instructor commented on was the fact that somebody can go online at home. They can access their class recordings. They can go into our learning management system. We happen to use Moodle. They can access assignments. They can get in touch with their instructor. And yes, we are really have a lot of work that we've already been doing very well. I think, but it's a matter of capturing it through this data. And another interesting thing is how the bias of instructors, or what, how, how instructors are recognizing their own bias. In this case, it was noticed that she realized she was placing her framework on others. So she expected that the student should be in a classroom, would want to be face to face, but no, that wasn't the choice that they made. And the impact of assumptions on that quote unquote other in a foreign environment is definitely a theme because you have learning facilitators and instructors coming from very different backgrounds to our students. And they're living and working in a community that is foreign to them in a culture that they're not familiar with and they're outsiders. So how do we compensate for that? How do we build relationships? How do we engage our learners? It really comes down to meeting them where they're at. Now this was a teacher that's noticing the inequity and feeling the crunch of online learning because one of the issues is that you have to be very organized and you have to plan your entire semester pretty much ahead of time. There's spaces for constructivism and there's spaces for spontaneity, but it's not in any way the same as an on-site classroom. He only had, uh, he, this was actually for his social studies class, he only had it two days a week and he was not sure how he was going to get through all the material. You take into account holidays, student absences, things like that, plus you're doing it at a distance and it, it takes a lot of creativity and a lot of dedication to the students in getting hold of them in other ways. So one of the best practices obviously is pick up the phone, call them. Something else that some of our instructors do is they use their text chat with the students. Another instructor actually created a Facebook page because the students do have access to that if they have cell phone service in their community. We do have a couple of communities without cell phone service. So technology and learning, and this was mine, a picture of mine, and I'm going to talk about the quality of the pictures in just a moment. but. The transition programming, so technology and learning. So even though our students have cell phones and they can access Facebook on their cell phones, it doesn't translate to digital literacy. And what we do is we say, OK, we're going to have two days of online, lear uh, online orientation. We're going to teach them how to use Collaborate, how to get into Moodle. We're going to tell them about our program. And we're going to review some good study skills. And I question whether the, a couple of hours of that is sufficient. I've actually helped out instructors who have high school students who, who uh, they are assessed very high. And they might be in a grade 11 or grade 12 class, but they have zero li digital literacy skills. 
So the impact on their learning is pretty high. And speaking of technology, no one questioned the technology that we use. So I used disposable cameras, and the reason was it had to go through our institutional research com ethics committee, and in order to assure that the photos stayed confidential because I didn't have a cohort of participants in front of me. They're scattered throughout our region. So I assumed, being the researcher, that everybody would know how to use them. I mean, how hard could it be? And every single participant, including myself, got many grainy and dark images. And it didn't click on us that we had to use the flash. So I thought, what irony. I thought, how perfect is that? Doesn't that completely illustrate what we do to our students, especially with that previous slide? Here you go. Here's some online orientation. You've got an hour under your belt. Now go for it. Have fun. And what I'm looking forward to with phase two with our students is that reflection and expression part. Dialogues continuing, expression of ideas, there's collaboration and reflection. Hopefully we're going to create some new innovations and ideas out of it. We're really looking forward to that. Okay, so I kind of flew through that because it, it's, it's a lot of background. It's a lot of, obviously, like you said, I think it was Vanessa mentioned that it's a lot of work. It is. We're, we deal with a lot of different barriers, and I do want to speak about that a little bit. But I just want to take a pause and see if anybody has any other comments or questions before I move on. If you're ready to move on, you can either say in the chat, go for it, or you can show me with a happy face. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So feel free to type in the chat if you relate to any of this with any of your learners. Joffrey might be a little bit different. You'd have different barriers if you're dealing with gifted students, I think. But it's at the other end of the spectrum. So I'm wondering how similar some of the, the strategies would be. But for our students, they're coming in with extremely low self-efficacy. Transportation is a huge issue. And big gaps in their education. The K-12 system up here isn't that the greatest. There's a lot. It's a lot of people can access it. Um, there's a lot more support of education. But there's also a lot of negative experiences. So we're dealing with systemic oppression. We're dealing with um, students who aren't getting proper support, who may have had disabilities. We're dealing with a lot of issues surrounding poverty. And I read some really interesting research about that, how learners who come from lower socioeconomic status, they come with it to us with a different language. And they deal with a lot of different experiences and expectations than we realize from maybe a more middle class point of view. The lack of confidence and the low self-esteem obviously comes with self-efficacy. And it's interesting, Joffy, that you said that the fear and the gaps come from perfectionism, that can be just as paralyzing, can't it? Right, and the ones who have a learning difference or disability. And what we did was we looked at things like learning barriers instead of learning disabilities. We do have a lot of students who are struggling with addictions or violence or abusive either background or current situations. There's um, a lot of studies right now around PTSD, so that post-traumatic stress syndrome, and how it affects children and teens and youth in their later years. We're actually doing a professional development se session on it in April with our faculty. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. And of course, as an institution, there's the language of the institution. So we have students who not only have language barriers, but coming from a position of 
being outside of the norm, being outside of traditional practices, they don't really have experience with the language and the hidden rules that come with any kind of institution. Location, obviously, is a very big issue. Funding, access to computers, digital literacy I spoke about, transportation, and yes, those learning disabilities. And I'm hoping to, if I don't get time to show you, uh, I do have a couple of how-to videos that we created that I'll share with you in the chat. Yes, those cultural differences are huge. And uh, we just did a professional development se session with our faculty on LBGTQ issues and how to create safe environments for our students who identify with different gender preferences. And it's huge. The student wellness piece, that is incredibly big. I had no idea, I have to admit. Um, until a few years ago, I went to a conference, and she was talking about student wellness. Yes, at risk, gifted is at risk, bullying. So there's your, your DSMV. I don't know if you have the same thing there in Australia, but the DSMV, what, where, how they diagnose learning disabilities. So we have those medically diagnosable, assessed disabilities, and then we have a plethora of other issues that be, become barriers for our students. We have our on-site mentors, and that's where a lot of my research is coming, pointing towards, actually, is how do you best support First Nations students? How do you support Indigenous learners? How do you support learners who are at risk? That on-site mentor is key. So whether it's a tutor, or it's a learning facilitator, a BEd, or just a volunteer, it's key to promoting success with learners who are underrepresented and at lower levels. Counselors, we have counselors. Not everybody has that. But if we're able to integrate counseling or supports within a student wellness strategy, that includes things like teaching our instructors about modifications and adaptations. And it means orientation not only for our instructors, but for our students as well. And what we've decided to do is do some student development training. So two times a week, we take a lunch hour, and we have different guest speakers, and we have different themes. So we have a career month, because a lot of our students up here, it's oil and gas, it's forestry. We offer nursing programs and trades programs. But anything beyond that is not really within, the, within their realm. So we really want to make it uh, clear that there's a lot of possibilities when it comes to education. We also do Wellness Month, where we talk about things like nutrition, or we have inspirational pick speakers. And that's a way of promoting that community. There's so many things that we are trying to do online in order to translate and make up for that lack of physicality. So how can we make it more real for our students? So I already spoke a little bit about this with the institutional policy and recognizing low lear level learners. One thing I didn't mention was plain or clear language. And I see Joffrey said mentors are so valuable. Oh, and you, you do have the DMSC. But are there other best practices when it comes to institutions? That face-to-face -face component that you can think of that comes to mind? that you do. And I'm setting you up. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to think of all that you do face to face with a learner and what's worked really, really well. And moving it online. And I really, really appreciate this. Yes, explicit teaching of skills exactly. So what happens sometimes, and I, this is coming from research and from my own experiences, teachers are put online, not really trained in the fact that there are specific practices that you need to employ online in order to create learner-centered environments and create a sense of community. And Sir Ken Robinson, he talks about it, teaching not being a delivery system. So you're not just there to pass on the received information. And any good teacher knows that just by doing a lecture, this, that's just surface learning. There's no deep learning going on. Students aren't engaged with the materials. They're not going to remember it. And they're not really getting any kind of 
transformative learning out of it. And that's such a key feature, I think, with basic education students. It's seeing that transformation, seeing that confidence. Ah, that's awesome. Sir Ken gets a mention the second time today. So I'm not sure if I'm preaching to the choir here or if uh, you've all done online learning. So my apologies. I can skip through this quite quickly. It's hard to know what the experience is of those listening as well, if anybody listens to the recording. So some of the, the key features are using your voice effectively and using the slides effectively, being aware of the microphone and the video. So everything you, you're doing, like the answering the phone, we've had instructors answer the phone while they're in class and everybody in class heard them on the phone, those kind of things. Those are all kind of newbie experiences. And learning about good pace and tone, that's really important too. It's really important that you're comfortable with spaces. So a lot of, if you think in a face-to-face -face environment, you know, you're seeing the students and you're not you're not constantly talking to them. When you tell them to read page 35, you let them read page 35. But what often happens in an online environment, the instructor is uncomfortable with those spaces and the silence. And it's difficult for them to let the learners learn. And I think the big thing with translating it from face to face to online is the lesson plans plain to see. Also with the learning management system, I tell our instructors, you know, in the old days, all of your lessons and your objectives and your unit plans, they're all in your filing cabinet, and now they're in your learning management system. That, you wonder if they're really reading page 35 or playing a game. That's, and that's the other key practice when it comes to your on-site on person, is they're a way to check, give you those checks and balances as an instructor. But there's also things like using class starters and exit activities, using shorter activities, using the timer, going back and repeating things, providing lots of spaces for learning. And that means that uh, checking for understanding is such a big piece, isn't it? So getting people to use the check marks or use the smiley faces, our students are so used to using green check marks as yes and a red X as no. Uh, in order for me to know that they're listening, I'll say, okay, give me a smiley face or a laugh out loud. And I often catch them off guard. So you do use some same techniques that you would in a face-to-face -face environment. You're just using different technology. And I had to include this. I just read about it. Yes, yeah, Sarah. So. That's often the problem that uh, many of our instructors have, is they're worried about, are their students paying attention? And that's where the, the key piece and kind of a disconnect comes when you're a K to 12 instructor. Um, when you're dealing with adults, you're really teaching them self-directed skills and letting them be independent learners. Sometimes it's natural consequences. And as an adult, we have that ability. Well, at our college, we have some interventions that we, we put into play in order to help our learners succeed. Um, and you know, we can rely on that, that on-site person to connect with them. Because the distance instructor doesn't know the students as well as somebody who's face-to-face. -face, and that's just a reality. But online, you can try some, this, well, this is called artistic pedagogical technologies. And I'm a bit of an artist. So I was really attracted to this, Beth Perry and Margaret Edwards at Strathabaski University here in Alberta. And they've been doing distance education for a long time. And they talk about social presence and being real people, and that it's the responsibility of the teacher. So doing the lecture and not, um, Creating relationships, that goes back to the responsibility of the teacher. And I know, you know, if you were in a teaching, uh, teaching program where your practicum was a lot of criticism, and I know with ours, it was constantly, what are you doing wrong if your students are misbehaving? And uh, this kind of brings that back, that whole idea that, you know, it's the teacher's fault. But if you're using the technology, 
and it's still not working and you're not engaging your learners, sometimes that's just a reality, right? But the key is, is to use that technology. And with content, how are we creating a relationship with that and with the class community? And it is associated with positive outcomes. So some ideas to interact in class are read alouds. Like I said, check for understanding a lot. Get them talking on the mic. Get them writing in the chat. Videos, our instructors use a lot of videos. And app share is wonderful because you can show the students. You can get into a document and you can show them how to do something. You can get into the learning management system and show them how to do something. And of course, photos. And I noticed the, uh, the Aussie Live instructions to presenters talked about that. Using photos, talk about yourself. And that's, those are really good practices to engage people in what you're talking about. Something that I've used online is Storyfy. Has anybody used that? No? Okay, I'll show you it in just a moment. I've got a, just a couple more slides to show you. And then I'll, uh, I'll just take you into a little bit of an app share to show you a couple things that, and how they look. Because one thing that annoys me when I go to a conference and people talk about all these online ideas and then don't show me, I get frustrated. But another one is VoiceThread. This is a really cool online idea. And then here's a whole list. So I won't be able to show you everything, but Powtoon we use a lot. Video Scribe I've used. A Prezi you probably are familiar with. Um, screen capture, so making videos. I have a couple of instructors that use Pinterest, actually, and they, so they have Pinterest pages, especially for ESL. It's a really great way for them to teach about their, where they come from, their culture, as well as learn the English words. Animoto and Kazoa, they're slideshow creators. I've used Murali, which is an online brainstorming or um, concept mapping tool. Edmodo, uh, if you're from K-12, to you might be familiar with that because you of the confidentiality issues. Facebook wouldn't be allowed in a K-12 system, but Edmodo is. And then there's the top 100 online tools. So I'll put these in the chat so that you have them as well. So before I sign off, what I'm going to do is just take a couple of these off for you. Just bear with me for a moment. Okay, so in the chat, oh, you used voice thread, isn't it neat? So hopefully, uh, in the chat, just tell me yes if you see Storyfy and you see my picture up. Excellent. So what this is, is it's a way to connect social media into learning. So you create stories. So this one is about, we have a wear a pink shirt day for anti-bullying here on February 25th. So what I did was I put a search in. I did a new story up here. And I put in the term pink shirt day. And I was able to grab these different news items. Some of them are videos. Some of them are articles about bullying. And then that was how I promoted it to our students. Now, VoiceThread is awesome. So you'll see there's my picture. And I can comment on the, the we can, you can load a PowerPoint slide. You can just load one slide. And you, everybody who looks at the slide comments on it. And they can either record it, audio, they can do a video, that you can type something about it. And what happens is all the way around your slide are pictures of everybody who's commented on it. So it's a way to create kind of a more interactive discussion. It's very, very cool. This College Survival Kit is what we did for Powtoon. So this was something that 
we created to make it fun at orientation. So what exactly do you need to remember when you are a student? So you need a plate to remind that you, you that you'll have a full plate until the end of semester. And what we did with um, some of our on-site students is we actually handed these things out and we used it as a way to discuss things. Yes, voice threat is wonderful. I'm just so impressed with that. But this Powtoon is actually, you can get an educator's, you can, you can get a free subscription and you can also get an educator's subscription. And so this is all just created, it's very intuitive, it's very easy to use. This I just wanted to take you in very quickly. Oh, we're almost out of time and I know you might have another session to go to, so I don't want to take up all the time. But this is a course that, do I have a link to VoiceThread? Yes, sir, I'll put them in in just a moment. I just want to, I'll just finish showing you this, is our learning management system. It's called Moodle. And the students go in here, they click on this button in order to get into their online class. They click here to listen to their recordings. But what I wanted to show you was something that worked really, really well, and it was these weekly response assignments and the VoiceThread monthly assignments. So our students, every Friday, they knew that they had to do a forum. I missed it, sorry. They knew they had to do a forum. And what's really nice when you can get uh, either an online tool or in your learning management system and getting the students discussing, it's such a wonderful way to build relationships. So I had a weekly response, and then I had a monthly voice thread. So it was just different levels of engagement with the materials that we were doing. So with that being said, oh, and blogging, here's a great way to interact with your students. I just took a session on wiki, so I haven't tried a wiki yet, but a blog or a wiki is a great way to connect your students to some supplemental learning. And with that, I am going to go to my last page, and then I'm going to grab a couple of those links for you. And I'm just going to turn my microphone off for a minute. I'll leave it open for anybody who has any questions or comments. I'd just like to jump in uh, quickly and say a very big thank you to Lindy. Um, I've really enjoyed this session. And um, maybe we could all give her um, a round of applause using the applause button. Thank you very much indeed. I'll hand the microphone back to you. And Thank you. And please feel free to contact me. There's my Google contact and my Northern Lakes College contact. I will, I meant to um, post actually, I can post my slides somewhere. I don't know if, are you doing that with the conference? Are you having presenters post anywhere? Um, what, what participants can actually do now and in the recording is if they go to File, Save and Whiteboard and if they select the PDF version of the um, file type, they can save your slides. The recording will also be converted into an MP4 and loaded to our YouTube channel as well. Oh, that's wonderful. OK, so I will post these slides for you as well. And Sarah, I think I might have not inputted it the right way because it should come up as a, a link. But does anybody have any other questions? Or I see the badge. Was that Vanessa? Talked about the badges. Yeah, the next session is from Stucky, um, our keynote talking about designing badges to um, motivate, um, recognize, and celebrate. Nice. Yeah, that's a feature in Moodle, but um, I do have to go home. I'm going to try. I may pop in a little late into the session. I'll go home and, and catch, on, catch it there. I'm still at work, so. 
thank you so much, everyone. And I do hope to that our paths cross in the future. If you're ever in Canada, in Alberta, in Slave Lake, <laughs> let me know. Thank you so much, Lindy. Take care.